everyone can see can see a slide and just a slide, no like notes or other PowerPoint weirdness. It's clean. All yes. right. And we well, can't see the no. slide. Wait, not yet. Hmm. Oh, because there's an extra button that I didn't click this time. Okay. There you go. All right. Well, thank you for having me here today. And I'm pretty excited to talk to you about Agile and data science and some tips and strategies to get them to work together. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I was originally an electrical engineer. So that's what I went to school for. Um, that was not even remotely an Agile environment. So I come out of there and my first job was as a software engineer at Cox Automotive. And this is where I learned about Agile and how, how Agile teams work and how they function. And so I was doing data science, but it was very much an engineering team. So I you know, was really learning from the group Agile was, was made for. Uh, and then a couple years ago, I switched to my current team where I'm a senior data scientist. And so that's given me another different perspective on Agile uh, because while we still use Agile, it's I mean, it's a very different flavor. We're, we're a team of data scientists. We have a different approach to things. So it's really given me a chance to see like both from an engineering perspective and the data science perspective, how this can look and how this can go. So before I go, you know, diving into how we can make data science agile, let's start with what is data science. Uh, so the purpose of data science is to create business insights and help us make informed decisions. Sometimes you will call it telling a story about the data. Maybe you have customer records or, you know, information about your company or systems that your company runs. And you want to know what you can find out about that data. What can that data tell you about your company, how to run things better, be more profitable, make better decisions? So if, if you see any terms like data analytics, data analysis, business intelligence, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all of these things are more or less lumped together with data science. Uh, they're all different areas, and usually a person will specialize in one or two. So if, for example, I have very little idea how to be a good uh, business intelligence employee. My specialty is machine learning, but they're all, they're all very similar in that they're data-driven, data science type roles. Uh, and then finally, data science uses data and statistics and programming to try and achieve these goals. And I'm just going to really highlight the data for now. We're going to come back to that later. But the data in data science is very important. So I'm going to go on a quick tangent. Um, I mentioned that my data science specialty is machine learning. And so later, I have real life examples that I want to talk about. But it's really important that everyone has a, a basic idea of what a machine pro learning project is before I get there. Uh, so I really like this quote by Andrew Eng. Machine learning is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed. Some things that machine learning can do for us, it can predict a number like what, what should I price my house at? What's the interest rate? What's the temperature going to be tomorrow? Things like that. It can also predict category, categories. Is this a picture of a cat or a dog? Is this email spam? So next time you're in your spam folder digging out an important message that your email put there, you can thank a machine learning algorithm for that. Uh, and then it can also generate new content. So all of this, the, the big rage on the internet of generative AI with ChatGPT and Dolly and all the other ones making images, those are also forms of machine learning. We're not going into those today, but that's they are in that category. So how do we build one of these? The tongue in cheek explanation, you have a giant pile of math and you pour in your data and it spits out answers. And if you don't like the answers, if they look wrong, you just stir that big pile of math a little bit until they start to look right. Which is not how it works, but it also sort of is. Uh, so it's definitely true about data, lots of data. We love data. And when we say data, we often mean we have some example input and the expected output. So if we're trying to guess house prices, we might give it things like, 
you know, this house had this many bedrooms, this many bathrooms, this many square feet, and it sold for this price. And if you get that for a lot of houses, it can start making guesses if you give it a new house uh, what that price should be. So you have your data, you give the data to the training algorithm. This is the, the math that they were stirring in the last example. And then that will give you your final machine learning model. And then the one caveat I always like to throw in is if your data is garbage, your output will also be garbage. It'll give you a model and the model will give you predictions, but they will be bad predictions and you shouldn't listen to them if your data is not good. And so the last thing I want to touch on is how do we evaluate something like this? And so if we're predicting a number, we could look at the average error. So on average, how far off is our prediction from what it was supposed to be? Or if we're predicting a category, we can just look at things like what percentage of the time is it right? Or of all the times we labeled something a cat, how often was it actually a cat? Or of all the dogs in the data set, how many did we find? And the really important thing about this slide is just that all of these, these measurements are overalls, they're averages, they're percentages. Um, machine learning isn't something where you can look at individual errors. So like with software engineering, if you have a website and you click a button and it gives you an error, you might look at in this specific instance, why did it get an error? Uh, but machine learning is more overall performance. So if it's getting things right, 95% of the time, you don't generally come and say on Tuesday at four o'clock, I gave it a picture of this dog and it said it was a cat. What was wrong? Unless there's a trend of misidentifying dogs for cats and it does that, you know, a good percentage of the time, uh, we, you, it's, uh, it's never going to be 100% perfect. And this is also going to come back later in one of my examples. So, that's a little bit about machine learning and specifically going back to data science generally. It's a little like software engineering in some ways. Uh, both software engineering and data science require strong problem solving skills. Um, they, op they both involve writing code to build some kind of system or solution. That's definitely true of software engineering. Um, data science, it's often true, not necessarily, um, but that's, it is one similarity, similarity that there's often code involved. Aiming for uh, low code. Both group, yeah, and or if you're doing low code is also an option. Um, both groups also have to collaborate with product to determine the the scope of the project, the priority, what should I be working on? And if there's something deployable, like a, a predictive system or something, that's going to need engineering practices for that final solution, whether the data scientists write it themselves or they work with engineering. But it's also not like software engineering. So if you remember, the goal of data science is to deliver knowledge. So sometimes that's code that runs in production system. And sometimes it's the answer to a question like, how, many, how much customer churn can we expect this month? Uh, data is really important to the data science. If you can't get access to the data, uh, you, you can't do your data science project. And then there's also more of a focus on correct statistics versus that correct maintainable um, unit tested code. And I'm definitely not saying that that's not still important to have good maintainable code, but data scientists often come from a math or statistics background. And so their specialty is getting the statistics right, getting the, the probabilities right. So sometimes they've just picked up coding as a, a means to an end. This code is the thing that lets me do my statistics. So they won't have all of that background that a software engineer might come with where they've been taught how to do unit tests and how important it is to write maintainable code. And then I mentioned th uh, this a little bit before, but the systems are more, I worded it here, they're, the systems are probabilistic, not static. So they're taking a bunch of probabilities and making a guess. And this goes back to that idea of it's never going to be 100% right. If it, were, if it were something that's easy enough to be 100% right, you probably wouldn't need data science to figure it out. Uh, and then one of the really big ones, particularly when it comes to Agile, 
is that projects tend to be ambiguous, open-ended, and possibly even research-oriented. So in a data science project, you're much more likely to have proof of concepts and learning tasks versus uh, more straightforward, I need to build this thing. And to try and illustrate that a little more, I've got a spectrum where on the right side, we've got kind of like standard simple practices, things that are very familiar to us. We've done them before. They're predictable. We're confident we can do them. And on the other side, we have things that are very researchy. They're unpredictable. We don't even actually know if they'll work all the time. They might actually fail. Uh, and so if you think of maybe like a stereotypical movie that that crazy professor who's like, one day I will have my breakthrough. It's a little like that, that you're working towards something and you think that one day this might finally work. But you're never, you're never completely certain. And so software engineering tends toward the right side of the spectrum. And I put some kind of context examples where like the really predictable stuff might be like, I need the engineers to create a static web page. Really easy to estimate, really easy to figure out how long this will take you to do. As you go to the other side, Maybe you're using newer technology. You're going to have to figure out how it works. You don't know how long that will take. Um, but you're usually not going to go all the way to the other end. Um, so maybe like building really state-of-the-art technology. But there's not a lot of things where it's super uncertain if it'll even work. Uh, whereas data science is more likely to span this whole spectrum. So if you're doing something a little simpler, like creating a monthly report, something you've done before, this is something that would fit easily into Agile as is very few adjustments necessary. You you just do this report that you did last month, you know what you're doing, you know how long it'll take you. But things get more unpredictable as you start trying to build machine learning models or maybe even creating a new state-of-the-art model. Maybe you're working with those generative AI technologies that are brand new and we're not really sure what they're doing all the time. Or you've got some some brand new data from the company and it's exciting, but you don't even know what that data says. You don't know if you can do anything with it. And so that end of the spectrum is especially where some of the conflicts come up between uh, traditional agile and data science. And so while I was going over this talk, I was really struck by a couple of the a couple pieces of the Agile Manifesto in particular. And those were individuals and interactions over processes and tools, and then responding to change over following a plan. Uh, so as I was going over examples of where things did and didn't work, those two themes kept popping up. Uh, some of the principles too that I thought I that I just wanted to highlight quickly are things like welcoming changing requirements, even pretty far into development. And not just from external stakeholders, but your data scientists are kind of stakeholders too. As they're doing some of those more researchy projects, they might discover something that means, you know, we have, we have to change our plans, we have to change our requirements. And it's just something that might happen. Uh, working together with business and product and engineering and data science, the more everyone works together and understands what everyone's doing and why, and the better everyone works together, the more likely the project is to succeed and the better you're going to be able to handle things like, uh, like snags and delays because of unforeseen problems. Uh, I also liked the uh, working software is the measure of progress, but I'd amend that a little bit that knowledge and information sharing for data science is maybe the primary measure of progress. And then the retrospectives, the going back and making sure that everything is really working right for your team, uh, especially with uh, data science, because it's it's newer to Agile. It's not something that people have been doing for nearly as long. So getting that right is going to take a lot more a lot more adjustment and going back and refining what you're doing. So that is it for my intro. Uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to go over some common complaints either from data scientists or from agile practitioners about each other and also some uh, i call them case studies so they're all real things that either have happened to me or i've heard other people talk about but you know names and details have been changed to protect the innocent but nothing is completely made up they're all from real things that i've talked to people about 
And so the first one I have is that data science doesn't fit in sprints. The stories are big, they're hard to estimate, and even if you get them estimated, they just keep rolling over. So it doesn't really fit well in that idea of knowing how much effort something's going to take. Uh, and so the idea of changing your process to fit the people and the work they're doing uh, is really helpful for overcoming this problem. And one I see suggest a lot is use something like Kanban or Scrumban. Just let that story exist until it's done uh, is definitely one way to handle it. It's essentially what my current team is doing. Just when the story is done, it's done and that's fine. But another option that's open to people is, you know, if you still really want stories to fit within a sprint, make use of time boxed research spikes. Just say, I will take, you know, this much time and I will work on this project. And at the end of the sprint, we'll close out that story, create a new one, and, you know, just keep working on that part too. Uh, but those are, either one of those will can really help with the idea of like, oh, it doesn't fit in a sprint. And then very related to the idea of not fitting in the sprints are data scientists sometimes complain that the agile timelines are too rigid. You know, sprints are too short to have any kind of meaningful research progress to report. There's pressure to commit to timelines. Uh, and especially with data scientists, they it's really hard to judge how long something's going to take because it's sometimes something they've never done before. And so here again, we can change our process a little bit. Um, and I really like the solution of, instead of making deliverables have to be something working, something's finished, deliverables are a progress update. For the data scientists, this is a lot easier to commit to. Yeah, I can give you a mini presentation of what I found at the end of the sprint, not as big of a deal. These updates keep everyone informed. They can keep everyone feeling invested. You know, it, it doesn't feel like the data science is just over there not talking to anybody. And uh, even if there's no finished, you know, nothing's finished and working yet, you can still have conversations about where things going, you know, maybe it's not looking so good. Maybe we want to try something new. But those discussions are, are really helpful to have. And depending on how you present those updates, if there's a written record of it, it can be nice to go back and be like, what did I try two weeks ago? It, uh, it kind of helps force a little bit more organization of what you've been doing and what you're working on. And that brings us into my first case study about uh, the acceptance criteria and what does it mean for a story to be done. Uh, and so this is about, um, there's a project, they were trying to build an image classification system. So say we get images of critters and we wanna know, is this a cat? Is this a dog? Is this a cheetah? And so it's a brand new project and they hire someone brand new out of school, which is me, by the way. Um, and so got this brand new project, brand new machine learning person. And we get to the question, we're about to start this project. What can you commit to getting done in one sprint? I am new to this job. I am new to Agile. I would like to keep this job. And so all of my history of being a student and engineer is screaming, don't overcommit, find something that you can definitely say that you can get done. So I did. I said, I think I can find one critter that I can identify pictures of it with at least 80% accuracy. And this was fine. It worked. We got it done and we kept working on the project and things kept moving. But knowing what I know now, I really shortchanged myself and the project because I was so worried about that deliverable. A better answer really would have been, well, in two weeks, I can train a model and I will have results that we can discuss. The model might be garbage. I don't know. But I could have a fully trained model on all of the classes. And we would have moved just that little bit faster. And so little things like that can build up over time. Those little bit of delays of, oh, I'm going to take the safe route because I'm afraid of not meeting my deliverable could delay a project over time. Another uh, very related complaint, more long-term planning this time instead of short-term planning, but the idea that you can't plan a data science project. The data science will work on a story 
and then they'll change future work based on it. Or maybe you can't even create the next story until you know how this first part of the research pans out. And then that's not even getting into things like delays, setbacks, or sometimes the unfortunate discovery that something's just not going to work. Um, or not work well enough, which is another thing that can happen. You could have a project and it only ever, you know, it's right 70% of the time, but your customers won't accept anything less than 85. Um, so, you know, the project exists, but may not be good enough to use. Um, so this kind of goes with responding to change over following a plan. Um, one option is you can just accept limited future planning. Maybe you only even plan a sprint or two and just say, I, I don't know. We don't know what we're doing after this, and it's fine. Um, another option that I've seen is you can kind of separate out the research and say, okay, data scientists, you have one month, a quarter, however long. Tell me what you can about whether or not this project is feasible. Just really quick and dirty proof of concept. And then when they come back to you, they might say, yeah, I think this is going to work. And then you can move forward to something that's a little easier to plan. Or if they come back and say, no, this is this is not going to work, then you haven't put all of that effort into trying to plan how long is it going to take to make this thing before you knew that it wasn't going to work. And one thing I've definitely noticed is that the more involved the like the your scrum team and your product owner are, the more involved they are with the data science and understanding what they're doing, not like a I can do data science level, but understanding their process and how they work. Um, um, in my experience and talking to others, those teams do much better with planning than teams where the, the product owners kind of hands off and really just wants a deadline or to know, you know, how long will this take you and then when can we start the next thing? Another complaint slash problem is that data scientists are siloed. And they are. They have a serious tendency to be disconnected from the business, disconnected from engineering, kind of off in their own little world. Uh, data scientists, some data scientists might not understand business goals or the needs of the business, what they, they need to succeed. Other times it, the problem is that data science and engineering kind of mutually don't understand each other. And especially on teams where you're trying to deliver a system, it can be really difficult if engineering and uh, data science aren't speaking the same language. So this is definitely a case where communication is just so, so important. Uh, just that constant communication, what's our goal, what's our progress, keeping everyone in the loop. But also making sure everyone knows what everyone else is doing and why, uh, especially in the case of data science, helping them understand the purpose of different parts of Agile, different roles, what everyone's doing can really help getting everyone on the same page. And if you can do this, this better collaboration uh, can really smooth the path to production, which is a huge problem with data science. It is not at all uncommon for data science to create something and it works and they're excited about it, but there's there's no support or infrastructure or there's miscommunication with engineering and getting it into production is a real hassle. And if also if they uh, that better communication with product and the rest of the business can also help make sure that support is allocated so that they have that engineering resources to finish off their project and it doesn't just sit and collect dust. And so I have, well, I haven't been on all these projects, but I've talked to people and I've come up with three different projects that are kind of uh, different variations on how something like this might go, might go. But all of them can really be boiled down to business wants a data science team to come in and automate something that an engineering team already has working. So engineering is established, they have this applications they own, and business is like, hey, if data science comes in and automates this, this would be great. Uh, so 
a problem that can come up is the engineering team is protective of their data and their project. And this is generally a good thing. We want to protect our data. If our data is worth using, we want to keep it secure. We don't want it getting out now, whether that's, you know, company secrets or customers' personal data, or especially if anyone's in the health team, definitely don't want that health data getting out there. Uh, but the data science team needs access to the data and not just able to hook their system into it. The people need to be able to see the data so that they can look through it and be like, this feature looks like it might be useful. This part of the data uh, looks like it got corrupted and we have to fix that. Uh, so this is a place that things can really break down. And sometimes it does. Uh, there was a project and I was talking to someone and it wasn't really an agile project. Uh, there was no real product or scrum roles. There wasn't good communication between the teams. There was no one kind of above the two teams saying, hey, we're both going to work together and achieve this goal. There was just kind of a business request like, hey, you two teams should work together, sort it out yourselves. Um, but they never really did. There was no one to facilitate that communication. And eventually they just kind of gave up on the project because it wasn't going anywhere. Um, the, but there was another project where uh, there were product roles, there were scrum master roles and that did eventually help those teams work together. They found a compromise for how they can get at the data, for you know how data science can do their job without disrupting what the engineers were doing. And so this project did eventually get off the ground and succeed. Uh, the third example was uh, the project didn't even start until all of that stuff was hashed out. It's like, you cannot green light this project until you can promise that data science will have their data and that we have a system for working with engineering. And this one also succeeded and skipped a lot of the headaches that the other two had. So we don't always have control over how higher ups handle things and how things get worked out. But the more you can sort out beforehand and say, you know, I need this, I need this support, I need this data before this project makes sense, the more that we can do that, the smoother things are going to go. Another complaint from data scientists is that Agile has too much overhead. There's all of these meetings, and when we're not in meetings, we're like updating these stories, which is just such busy work, and it just takes away from our heads downtime. Because a lot like engineers, uh, data scientists are all about that heads down thinking, problem solving time. Uh, so this is something we're getting together retrospectively and talking over what's working, what's not, and what the purpose of these things are becomes really important. Uh, one thing that will definitely help this is using Agile to protect and prioritize the working time. Data science has a tendency to get surprise requests. Oh, could you just real quick do this for me? Oh, I have an idea. Could you just, yeah, we, there's a lot of that. And if there's no one to protect them, they can get really lost in the weeds. And sometimes those requests will snowball to more requests. Or other times they'll go and do all this work and come back and the response is, oh, that's neat, thanks. And then it's like, why, why did you want this if you're not going to do anything with it? And it's not a good use of anyone's time. Uh, and then frequently just evaluate the value of your meetings. Does it make sense to have a daily stand-up? Would once a week make more sense? Would using a dedicated Slack or Teams channel where people can just post their updates make more sense? Uh, anything that the teams feel like, yes, we're, we're getting the value out of this, me this meeting or whatever that we're supposed to be getting uh, with minimizing the impact of time. And so there was um, a Scrum Master I talked to who told me about going through almost exactly this. He, they're trying to move this data science team to Agile. He gets assigned to them. But that team is just really concerned about the overhead. There's all these meetings and all of this planning, and they're just really worried about how this is going to affect their focus time. They felt like they already didn't have enough time to get all their work done, and now we're just adding to it, to their responsibilities. Um, but as he starts to work with them, 
he realizes that, hmm, they're really getting a lot of their time wasted. Uh, they're trying to self-manage themselves. They're getting those surprise work requests I talked about. Priorities keep changing. There's no one to prioritize for them. So they'll start on a project and then they'll have to context switch every time they change to something else. And then they go back to that project, but they've lost all of that. Uh, you know, they have to load it back up into their brains. What was I working on again? So they were just wasting so much time with that. And so his point was that the, you know, this, this team is very disconnected from the business and just, just kind of showing the team, like, here's all the ways that Agile can actually help you and protect your time and help you be better at your jobs. And then the last complaint I have is a general metrics disconnect. Um, and so Agile metrics can be meaningless to data science. So if you're a company that's interested in sprint velocity and things like that, that's often not meaningful to a data science start data, data scientist. And then data science metrics can be confusing to stakeholders. So this is why earlier I was talking about um, data science and machine learning, they're about overall performance. They're about aggregates. Uh, you, And so that's, you know, what this illustration is about. You know, don't don't focus on this one time it got wrong and be like, oh, why why did this happen? It has, we know we have to fix this specific instance. You need to be looking at overall how it's doing and is that acceptable? And so going back again and changing our process um, for the data science concern, you can try to change metrics to reflect true progress uh, or ignore metrics depending on how much your, your company is really into uh, measuring how fast performance goes. Uh, and then you also work with data science to set expectations. The earlier in the project, the better. Uh, but setting expectations like this will not be right 100% of the time, um, or you know, this, you know, this is how you measure a machine learning model and this is the kind of performance you expect, those kind of things going over those early and often if needed can help everyone understand what they're talking about and what's important. And so my last case study is about this. Um, there was a project, it was just to automate some data entry. So humans were entering data and we're like, hey, we can, we can do some data science machine learning and we can fix this. And there was a situation where this, the system was actually doing really good. It was somewhere over 90% accuracy, but we kept getting these questions. Like it got this one thing wrong. Can you, can you fix that? Why did it get this one thing wrong? Uh, and so it definitely took a lot of back and forth to go over like, okay, we got this one thing wrong, but all of these other things are right. How important is that one thing that was wrong? And going through this, one of the things we discovered was that people actually had a higher expectation of the AI than of the humans doing the labelers. Sort of. Like, they, at the same time, thought the humans were doing better than they actually were at, like, not typoing and entering this data. And they expected the AI to be even better than the humans at the same time. And so there was a lot of digging until we, we sorted all this out. It was like, they're not 100% accurate. And neither are we, but like, are we comparable? That's that's really what's important here. Uh, so before I uh, wrap this up, I wanted to do a nice little summary about how Agile can help data scientists. Like if you ever find yourself tasked with working with a data science team, these are your selling points to get them on board. You want to sell them on protecting their heads down time. That project prioritization, protection from side, qu yeah, side quests, um, extra requests, you know, just se sell them on the fact that like you can really help them protect their work time and they don't have to focus on these things. That faster road to production, if it's a team that is creating systems like a machine learning model or an AI system, that better communication it can get them the resources they need and the understanding they need between these different groups to actually 
get their project out there and running because no no one wants to make a project and then have it just sit there because oh, we don't really know how to de how to deploy this uh, and then better communication with business just it's not all data scientists but I have heard some complain like I don't I don't really know how I'm contributing or how this is re you know is this making an impact on the business but the better that communication is and you can tell them like yeah this you know we made these decisions based on what you did is another big selling point and then a couple of ways that agile can accommodate the different way data scientists work just accept that limited ability to plan it's the price of doing data science is sacrificing some of your ability to plan. Adjusting expectations on those deliverables, you know, taking status reports instead of focusing so much on when will the code be done. And then facilitate communication and understanding. And you know, kind of remembering that, you know, they're not, they don't, they have different backgrounds. They maybe don't quite understand the purpose of agile. Um, just help them understand and get that that knowledge of why Agile is helpful. And then don't expect them to be software engineers. They, they do different work. They have different backgrounds. Uh, they can absolutely learn from software engineers and vice versa. The software engineers can learn from them. Uh, but the the tricks of the trade you, learn, you use to teach a new software engineer how to work in Agile are probably not going to be the same for a data scientist. Uh, so that is all I have prepared, but I am more than happy to answer any questions anyone has.